So how do we spot bias in selection of the reported result? Um, best thing to think about is um, for those of you who've already taken a look at the ROB2 tool, um, you might have noticed that there is a couple of preliminary considerations or um, checkboxes that we ask you to fill out at the start of the tool before you answer any signaling questions. And the last um, set of checkboxes on the first couple of pages of ROB2 asks you to indicate which of the following sources you obtained to help inform your risk of bias assessment. And so we have a, a, quite a detailed list of possible sources that could inform your assessment, such as the journal article, the trial protocol, registry record, or even just contact with the authors. And the reason why we put this particular um, uh, list at the start of the tool is for two reasons. One, it's to prompt authors to actually consider making use of this, uh, these sources when um, completing their risk of bias assessment. Um, and not just for this particular domain, it can be useful for any of the domains of bias, particularly in the case where maybe a trial report is quite brief where, and the details about the randomization process um, have been presented in much more detail in the protocol. Um, but in addition to this just serving as a prompt to ask people to consider using these sources, completing it too and sharing this information about what sources you accessed when performing your assessment is helpful to readers in that it can help us determine how, I guess, reliable your risk of bias assessment is or how complete it was. Because as you'll see in the next few slides, sometimes if you're just only being able to rely on the journal article, then you may have an incomplete picture um, uh, to help inform your assessment of bias in this domain. And the reason for that is because ideally we want to have access to a pre-specified analysis plan for the trials included in our review. And so that could be that, that information could be included in a trial protocol or even in a very detailed trial registry record. Um, uh, and that may be sufficient. Um, but I will note that in, in my experience, trial registry records have, are not always uh, super detailed when it comes to um, the outcome measure they use or the time point or the analysis method. Sometimes they will just specify the domain. Um, but if they have provided detailed information, then that can be useful to this part of the assessment. Um, but the, probably the most useful would be to get access to this, the full statistical analysis plan uh, for a trial, which I've noticed has become more available in recent years um, for, particular, for clinical trials. Um, and when looking at the, um, the pre-specified plans, it's helpful to check if there's any amendments or updates to the plans. So I remember when I first consulted um, or had a look at clinicaltrials.gov, I remember looking at a registry record for a trial, and then it was only when I took a closer look and noticed that was actually not the first version of the trial registry record. And there was a whole history page showing each of the iterations of the registration record. And so having access to the, the first and early versions is um, ideal, and then seeing whether the information about the measurements or analyses have changed over time. Um, and it's also good, most, mostly this information is usually date stamped. So you can figure out if it actually is truly pre-specified. Um, because essentially when you're looking at um, your analysis plan, whether that's in a formal statistical analysis plan document or a registry entry or a protocol, um, ideally it should be date stamped um, and there should be, which allows you to confirm that the analyses that were planned were actually finalised before unblinded outcome data were made available for analysis. And so what I mean by unblinded outcome data is essentially the data set that tells the trial investigators which group participants have been assigned to. Because if they know that and can start running the analyses, then potentially they could make some tweaks to their analysis plan based on having a peek at the results and noticing the results aren't necessarily going in the way that the authors originally intended them to go. So um, take a close look at when these files were date stamped um, in order to make your assessment. Um, and if you do, if you are uh, lucky um, enough to have access to an analysis plan or protocol, um, what you should do then is check whether the trial report actually agrees with it. So is the information consistent across the two sources? 
or is there evidence that outcome measures appear to have changed between the sources or analysis methods have changed with some potentially dropping from the final report and others potentially being added post hoc um, and, it, and focus on it whether there's any explanation for these changes. Um, and I'll show, in a, and I think in the next slide, that some reasons are quite legitimate, so it shouldn't necessarily um, be demonising um, a trial just because there's a discrepancy. Um, but I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and again, uh, it's helpful to think that when you're doing this assessment, you're really only focusing on any changes or discrepancies that relate to the trial results that are being assessed for risk of bias. So if you're assessing risk of bias in the results for pain that has been made available, and that's the only result you're going to look at, it doesn't really matter if the authors of the trial have made a lot of changes to the analysis for, say, anxiety, because if you're not assessing that domain, then it's not going to have an impact on your risk of bias assessment for this. Um, now, in terms of making sure what the actual reasons for the differences are, um, as I said, sometimes the reasons can be legitimate. It's not just because the authors have decided to um, uh, manipulate the data in a way that um, gives them the results that they want. Um, so it's possible that sometimes planned cut points for a continuous outcome me measure needed to be modified because the distribution of the data differed to what was anticipated. So the authors might have wanted to split the, uh, the particular Likert scale score at the median value, but then noticed there was quite a ceiling or floor effect and trying to dis uh, distinguish them in that particular original way was going to end up with potentially empty bins. So that might have led them to actually do a more reasonable change. Um, it's also possible that the timing of the assessment might have had been delayed because the measurement device was broken at the time um, the trial was being conducted. Or, or some other disruption happened, um, such as a global pandemic. Um, and sometimes plans may need to be modified, sorry, plans might have been modified before the authors actually conducted any analyses, yet they just didn't update the trial registry entry or the protocol or the statistical analysis plan. So I guess if you find any evidence of these discrepancies, it's helpful to contact the trialist for clarification. Um, and see if they can give you a, uh, uh, give you the reason why such changes were made. And then you can judge how reasonable you think they were. Um, now, I imagine some of you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but I personally have never seen a protocol for my trial or trials in my area are never registered prospectively. And that's often the case for a lot of uh, um, areas and particularly when you're working with older trials. So you may not have access to a pre-specified analysis plan. That doesn't mean that this whole domain is a write-off. You can still make an assessment of risk of bias. Um, so the first thing I would do is compare the method section with the results section and see whether any outcome measurements or analyses that are reported in the results actually match what was described in the method section. Um, it's, it's, I guess I'm, I, I, you do see on a not too uncommon um, period, um, people saying all these particular analyses that they do kind of reported in the method section, but then some half of them might just disappear when it comes to the results and there's no explanation as to why. Or there could be some new measures or analyses appear out of nowhere in the results section. Um, and so this might raise your suspicion that something might be going on with this trial when it comes to its analysis. Um, and then some other, we've come up with a list of other possible uh, rules of thumb or general signals that you might want to consider uh, when you don't have access to a pre-specified plan. Um, and so you might have multiple reports relating to a particular study. Um, and if you find that the outcome measures and analyses were inconsistent across the multiple reports, that might raise your suspicion and might lead you to contact the authors for clarification. Also consider the area you're working in, whether the subscales, uh, whether, the, whether you also have done something unusual. So have they reported subscales for a particular scale that really never ever um, seems to be reported in that way? Um, and there doesn't seem to be any good reason why the authors decided to create a subscale um, and decided to use a different scoring system to the original. Or it could be that the authors have categorised the continuous outcome measures in an unusual way, 
or there might have been an unusual combination of unanticipated adverse events that the authors have categorised as serious versus minor. And so these types of questions really will require you having some insight into that clinical area um, in order to help, uh, I guess, determine whether what the authors have done appears to be non-standard and, and, and is associated with also the results being very favourable to the uh, result. Um, sometimes it can also help to look across multiple studies addressing the same question. So I remember coming across in a review I did, there was four trials evaluating the same question and pretty much they all had very positive results in favour of the active intervention, but one of them stood out because it used a very different um, a way of calculating the score for a particular scale, which is consistent with all the others and it just raised my suspicion that something might have been going on there. Um, and finally, what you need to do though is take all of these sources you have access to into consideration when reaching a risk of bias judgment. So sometimes you might come up, be, uh, find a trial report where once you've cross-checked with the protocol, you notice that some results that were pre-specified appear not to have been reported. If, however, you contact the trialists and they give you all of the results, then it's okay and you shouldn't be rating that particular result at risk of bias. Or if, say, you get access to a full clinical study report that's made available to regulators, which has all the data that you want and need, um, then again, uh, as long as you have all those results, then there's no point in demonising the trial just because for one of the articles they um, did not report everything. Um, so look at all the report sources when making your judgment.